Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. A grand jury in Manhattan has indicted Donald Trump on more than 30 criminal counts related to hush money payments Trump made to adult film star Stormy Daniels during his 2016 presidential campaign. The charges come four and a half years after Trump's former personal attorney and fixer, Michael Cohen, pleaded guilty to charges of tax evasion, bank fraud and lying to Congress about the hush money payments, which he says Trump directed him to make. It's the first time a former president has faced criminal charges in the United States. Trump is expected to surrender to authorities Tuesday. He responded to the indictment by releasing a long statement that read in part, quote, this is political persecution and election interference at the highest level in history. We'll have much more on Trump's indictment after headlines. Senator Bernie Sanders and New York Congress member Jamal Bowman, backed by other progressive lawmakers, are calling on the Biden administration to reconsider U.S. policy towards Israel, quote, in recognition of the worsening violence, further annexation of land and denial of Palestinian rights, unquote. The letter, which has been circulating in both chambers of Congress this week to garner support, calls for a probe into whether U.S. weapons are being used to commit human rights abuses against Palestinians. Dozens of Jewish leaders and community groups are also supporting the letter. This comes amidst rare public rebukes of Israel by U.S. officials over its now-paused plan to gut the judiciary and its plans to illegally expand its settlements on Palestinian land. On Thursday, Palestinians marked Land Day with marches, protests and speeches across the occupied territories. Meanwhile, Israel's Law Professors Forum, representing 120 prominent law professors, has joined human rights groups in comparing Israel's treatment of Palestinians to the former apartheid government of South Africa. Earlier this week, the new head of Human Rights Watch, Tarana Hassan, urged the U.S. and other allies of Israel to help hold it accountable for its rights violations. We see that this is not a human rights compliant government. This is a government that's actually on, on, this, on, a, on a rampage against human rights um, domestically against its own people in Israel, and they are pushing back. In Mexico, authorities have arrested five out of the six people who had arrest warrants issued against them, including three officials from the National Immigration Institute and who face homicide charges after at least 39 asylum seekers were killed in a fire at an immigrant jail in Ciudad Juarez, near the U.S. border. One of the survivors was also taken into custody, accused of starting the blaze Monday as dozens of migrants protested horrific conditions inside the overcrowded jail where they weren't provided water or food. Authorities began identifying the victims of the fire and notifying loved ones in their home countries thousands of miles away. Most of the dead were indigenous people from Guatemala. Others were from Honduras, El Salvador, Venezuela and Colombia. This is Maria Miranda, the wife of 43-year-old victim Carlos Pachecho, a construction worker from El Salvador. I hope justice is served. It is not fair how so many innocent people die, people who fight for their families, who fight to give them a better life, put food on the table and make sure they have all they need. It is not fair. We need justice because they could have helped and they didn't. They didn't. The Vatican has formally rejected the Catholic Church's doctrine of discovery used to justify European colonialism in Africa and the Americas, which dates from papal bulls issued in the 1450s. In a statement issued Thursday, the Vatican said the documents were, quote, manipulated for political purposes by competing colonial powers in order to justify immoral acts against indigenous peoples that were carried out at times without opposition from ecclesiastical authorities. Unquote. Many indigenous leaders welcome the Church's repudiation of the doctrine of discovery, which came eight months after Pope Francis toured Canada and apologized for the Catholic Church's role in Canada's brutal Indian residential school system, where many students died. In Nashville, Tennessee, more than a thousand protesters flooded the state capitol building Thursday, demanding an end to gun violence. 
The protest followed Monday's mass shooting at Covenant School in Nashville, where a shooter armed with two rifles and a handgun killed three adults and three nine-year-old students. This is 16-year-old Tennessee high school student Chloe Spangler. I have grown up all my life being scared of getting shot in school, and um, I really just want to fight for gun control because I'm tired of my life being put second to a firearm. Um, and I want students to have the opportunity to be able to share their voices because they are the ones being affected by this issue. The protest came as Tennessee's Republican-controlled legislature is considering measures to further deregulate guns. One bill would allow people as young as 18 to carry rifles and shotguns in public without a permit. Another would allow education workers to carry concealed handguns on school grounds with a permit. Today begins the funerals for those killed in the mass shooting. Later in the broadcast, we'll speak with Dr. Katrina Green, an emergency physician in Nashville, who joined Thursday's protest at the Tennessee Capitol. Today marks International Transgender Day of Visibility, a celebration of trans and non-binary people. Actions and protests are planned across the United States and worldwide, including here in New York, as communities fight intensifying discrimination, violence and anti-trans laws. On Capitol Hill, progressive lawmakers have reintroduced the Transgender Bill of Rights, the measure revived by Congressmember Pramila Jayapal and Senator Ed Markey would, quote, provide protections for transgender and binary people, ensuring that everyone has the opportunity to thrive regardless of their gender identity or expression. Quote. This year alone, there have been at least 450 anti-LGBTQ bills proposed in state legislatures and Congress. Washington, D.C.'s historically black metropolitan AME Church says it's seeking $22 million in punitive damages against the far-right Proud Boys group for destroying the church's Black Lives Matter sign in 2020 and terrorizing black communities. On Wednesday, church leaders and congregants testified in a D.C. court that the lawsuit seeks to permanently deter the Proud Boys from future attacks. In Russia. Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich pleaded not guilty Thursday to charges of espionage during a brief appearance in a Moscow court. Gershkovich's lawyer said after the hearing he was not allowed in the courtroom and not allowed to see the charges against his client. They held a quick hearing. I don't know how long it lasted. Three minutes, 15 minutes, I don't know. And that's it. And after that, as far as I understand, again, I can only guess what position has been taken. Evan was taken away from here with the decision to hold him in custody. Gershkovich was awarded to be held in custody until May 29th. The Wall Street Journal denied the allegations and is seeking his immediate release. The Biden administration called the espionage charges ridiculous and demanded immediate consular access to Gershkovich. Many foreign news organizations pulled out of Russia last year after President Putin signed a law making it a crime to disseminate what the Kremlin calls fake information about the invasion of Ukraine. The chief executive of Fox News ordered reporters at the far-right network to stop fact-checking Donald Trump's false claims about election fraud after Joe Biden's victory in 2020. That's according to an email from CEO Suzanne Scott, revealed as part of a $1.6 billion defamation lawsuit filed against Fox by Dominion Voting Systems. In a message sent in early December 2020, Scott wrote of the fact-checking, quote, "'This has to stop now. The the audience is furious, and we're just feeding them material. Bad for business, she wrote. Another email revealed Scott encouraged Fox News to book Mike Lindell, the CEO of MyPillow, and a prominent election denier, saying he would get ratings. And the 2023 Izzy Award for Outstanding Achievement in Independent Media will be shared by The Lever, 
Mississippi Free Press, and journalists Carlos Ballesteros and Liza Gross. The lever exposes corruption behind the nation's most powerful institutions, leaders and companies, from dark money, influence and the Supreme Court to Medicare privatization. Mississippi Free Press is a women-led team reporting on racial and economic inequities and covered the ongoing water crisis in Jackson while fighting for transparency and public access to open records. Carlos Ballesteros's report for Injustice Watch exposed how two Chicago police officers issued arbitrary denials of U visas, which offer a path to citizenship for undocumented victims of crime, leading to a review of all denied U visas in Chicago and plans to rework the city's visa procedures. Liza Gross of Inside Climate News uncovered how oil companies have bought the ability to dump toxic wastewater on farms in Kern County, California. An award ceremony for the winners will take place in April. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. When we come back, we'll look at the indictment of Donald Trump, the first former U.S. president to face criminal charges. Stay with us. An order performed by Robert Walsh. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Donald Trump was indicted Thursday, becoming the first former president ever to face criminal charges in the United States. Trump is expected to surrender to authorities and appear in court on Tuesday. Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg has not released the exact charges against Trump, but according to press accounts, the grand jury indicted Trump on more than 30 counts. Bragg's case focused on hush money payments Trump made to adult film star Stormy Daniels during his 2000. 2016 presidential campaign to cover up his affair with her. The charges come four and a half years after Trump's former personal attorney and fixer, Michael Cohen, pleaded guilty to charges of tax evasion, bank fraud and lying to Congress about the hush money payments, which he says Trump directed him to make. Cohen served time in prison. Donald Trump is still facing three other major investigations. Veteran prosecutor Jack Smith is leading a Justice Department probe into Trump's role in the January 6th insurrection and attempts to overturn the 2020 election. In Georgia, Fulton County District Attorney Fannie Willis is investigating Trump's effort to overturn Biden's victory in Georgia in 2020. And in New York, Attorney General Letitia James has sued Trump and his Trump organization for fraud related to his business dealings. On Thursday, Donald Trump responded to the indictment by releasing a long statement that read in part, quote, this is political persecution and election interference at the highest level in history, unquote. In recent weeks, Trump has railed against prosecutors investigating him. Trump recently posted a photo of himself holding a baseball bat next to a picture of Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg, who's Manhattan's first black DA. Trump has also referred to Bragg as an animal. This all comes as Trump is running for the White House again. Under the U.S. Constitution, Trump can remain in the race, even if he's convicted. In 1920, Eugene Debs ran for president on the Socialist Party ticket while in prison. To talk more about the indictment of Trump, we're joined by Ellen Yaroshevsky, professor of law at Hofstra University Law School. Welcome to Democracy Now!, Professor. Why don't you begin with your response to this historic indictment? 
relieved that this matter is finally going to be in a court of law rather than just in the media, because it's so important to affirm the idea that we have a rule of law and that no one is above the law. So we'll wait and see what a jury does when they hear the facts and they apply the law. Explain what we understand at this point. The indictment has not been unsealed. That apparently will happen on Tuesday, when Trump will surrender to New York authorities. It's believed. Um, he will have a mugshot taken. He will be fingerprinted. Um, and he will be in court. It's expected. But explain what we understand these charges are about. Well, we don't know for a fact, let, let's say, until the indictment is actually unsealed. What we expect there about is that he, he falsified business records in the hush payments to uh, regarding the Stormy Daniels matter. And as a result of falsifying those payments, he actually had the intent to influence the federal election. That makes it a felony. If it were just falsifying business records, which is really clear happened, because Michael Cohn has served prison, time in prison for that, that would just be a misdemeanor. But in order to elevate it to a felony, there has to be another crime, the intent to violate another crime. And the, the thought here is, and it's a thought, it's not proof, that, that the other crime would be to influence the federal election. What's interesting about this, Amy, even though that's an in, that's a untested theory, um, that three days before th this happened was the Hollywood Access tape. And so the idea here would be that because he the Hollywood Access tape undermined his, his election prospects, that he really needed to uh, engage in this conduct to make sure that his record of falsifying payments to hush—falsifying falsifying hush money payments wouldn't be revealed. Now, explain that further, because uh, this—the hush payment to Stormy Daniels came less than two weeks before the election, and just after um, that tape that was released. Well, it, it didn't matter. When the hush money payments were made, right, Michael Cohn talked about the checks. Trump had signed checks. And that those were the ways in which they falsified the payments, because they claimed they were legal expenses. They were not legal expenses. They were payments to Stormy Daniels. So that, that, that's the way that unfolded. And Karen McDaniels, the um, Playboy model, who apparently also got hush, um, hush money payments. Talk about the charges. And or we don't know what the well, charges are, but how this all relates. Well, we don't know. But what we do know is the fault we're looking at falsifying business records and any of the payments that were made were made theoretically under, this is what Michael Cohn says, right, is they said that they were legal expenses. They were not legal expenses. They were, they were payments made to ensure that both of those women did not talk and explain what, what had happened. That's why it, that's a misdemeanor to have done that. And when we said the indictment has up to 30 counts, that means 30 different charges, for each of those payments, for each check, that could be a different charge. And her name is Karen McDougall. Um, earlier this month, Trump's former personal attorney and fixer, Michael Cohen, spent several hours testifying to a state uh, grand jury in Manhattan. He previously pleaded guilty to charges of tax evasion, bank fraud and lying to Congress about the hush money payments, which he says Trump directed him to make. This is not revenge, right? What this is is about accountability. I don't want to see anyone, including Donald Trump, indicted, prosecuted, convicted, incarcerated, simply because I fundamentally disagree with them. This is all about accountability. He needs to be held accountable for his dirty deeds. Talk about the significance of what he's saying. Well, he's going to t testify. His testimony is significant. Hopefully, there will be other witnesses who will testify as well. But a, par a part of the significance is that he will be cross-examined, and his credibility will be put at issue, and that will be a significant issue before any jury. Uh, Michael Cohn's made a lot of statements. Michael Cohn spe spent time in prison. My Michael Cohn was indicted by the Trump by, by the tr during the Trump administration. So all of those will be factors as the jury considers Michael Cohn's testimony. So, can you respond to those who say that they feel that Donald Trump 
should be indicted, but for far more serious crimes, among them, for example, inciting the insurrection. And the significance of this being put forward, and then the how strong this case is. I mean, we're talking about the credibility before a uh, Manhattan jury. Um, you have someone like uh, Michael Cohen, who uh, himself has uh, pled guilty to perjury and who has served time in prison, um, being the, the person who testifies, along with Stormy Daniels. Well, let me start here. Alvin Bragg is a very careful, diligent prosecutor. He's very experienced. He's been a federal prosecutor. He was a state prosecutor in the attorney general's office, where he investigated Trump. So coming into office, he knew very well, I think, what he was up against. He would not go forward, I believe, with an indictment unless there was significant evidence from which their office believes they can prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt. There may be other more significant cases, certainly the idea of an insurrection and trying to overthrow an, an elect, overthrow the government is a very serious charge, much more serious than this. But Alvin Bragg doesn't control that. He doesn't control the Georgia case that Fannie Whit Willis is considering. As a prosecutor, you can only take the case that's before you, take the facts that you have and investigate those facts. So it could be that if the timing had been different, people wouldn't be questioning, why bring this case first? This is the case that Alvin Bragg has. So let's talk about those other cases for a moment. You referred to them quickly, but uh, what he's facing in this federal investigation uh, in Washington, D.C., um, and what exactly Fannie Willis may bring charges against him for, the Fulton County DA, and then in New York, the attorney general, um, Tish James. There, there are many, as you've pointed out, Amy, these three cases. So, first of all, federal charges. Department of Justice brought in a lawyer, Jack Smith, a very experienced lawyer, who is examining the factors around the insurrection, what happened during the insurrection, Donald Trump's responsibility for it, classified documents. It's an ongoing and a sweeping investigation. We don't know what's going to happen. We do know that it appears that Jack Smith has been very diligent and forthright going after witnesses, trying to ensure that the crime fraud exception, for instance, um, would, would allow certain people to come forward and testify, including Mike Pence. Um, and so that's, that's going on. We don't know when or if there will be an indictment in that case. So that's one. Fannie Willis had a grand jury impaneled, and the grand jury gave her a report that, that she's now looking at to determine whether or not Donald Trump, through his calls to Brad's Raffensperger, trying to, quote, find 11,000 votes so that they could overturn the election in Georgia. That matter went before a grand jury in Georgia, and she's making a determination um, as to whether or not there will be an indictment in that case. A year ago, well, December of 22, Letitia James in New York um, filed a massive civil fraud case. It's, it's fraud and other financial crimes against Donald Trump and the Trump Organization regarding billions of dollars, billions of dollars as a result of overvaluing and undervaluing many of the properties of the Trump Organization and of Donald Trump. That matter is also proceeding. So we don't have a sense, time-wise, of when or if any of these other cases will, will, will proceed, whether there'll be other indictments, whether the Letitia James attorney general case will go, go to a jury. That, 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 that's all to be determined. All we know right now is, yes, there is one indictment that's this indictment, and it's the first time that Donald Trump or any president uh, will face criminal charges. And even though it's the first indictment, it doesn't necessarily mean it could lead to the first trial. Is that right? And what does it mean if he has charges brought against him in the federal um, with Jack Smith, uh, the Justice Department in Georgia and the state of New York? What happens then? Well, we'll have to wait and see. I mean, certainly, just because there'll be an indictment and an arraignment, which is when Donald Trump will show up and plead not guilty, presumably, and be released, um, there'll be a lot of motions that will be made. There'll be a timeline set up for motions. These cases do not proceed quickly. These are white-collar fraud cases. They can go on for years. So we don't know when there will or if there will ever be a trial in New York. 
We also don't know whether Jack Smith will ever indict uh, Donald Trump federally. But if so, the timing will have to be worked out. Obviously, you can't stay in trial in two separate cases at the same time. So the courts, the judges will have to decide upon timing. The same is true with respect to Georgia. It may be that the Georgia case could proceed if it's indicted earlier than the New York case. Donald Trump held his first major rally for the 2024 presidential campaign in Waco, Texas, last weekend, vowing to destroy the deep state and railing against prosecutors investigating his alleged crimes. This is what he said. When they go after me, they're going after you. The only way to stop these arsonists is to rebuke and reject this evil persecution by sending us straight back to the White House to expel the communists and the Marxists and all of them in 2024. Can you respond to what he's saying? Well, he's, he's asking for mob rule. He's asking us to undermine, this is not the first time, undermine the rule of law and not have a democracy, basically have a world in which Donald Trump um, is the only person whose opinion matters. We have a country, and we're trying to uphold democracy here. We're trying to uphold the rule of law. And so it's significant here that Alvin Bragg has brought this case, despite the fact that Donald Trump may continue to make such statements, despite the fact that there's going to be quite a reaction, I suspect, to Do Donald Trump's indictment. But we've got to uphold a system where there is a rule of law. He showed video of the violent attack on the Capitol at the Waco rally. Um, he also, of course, had tweeted that picture uh, holding a baseball bat uh, next to a picture of, um, of the Manhattan DA Bragg. Uh, right now, the police department is preparing for next week, as he has made allusions to people gathering there, calling on every police, um, uh, every police officer to be wearing uniforms. Um, talk about what will happen on Tuesday. I mean, do you expect a perp walk? Do you expect him to be shown with his hands behind his back, handcuffed? Donald Trump would probably like, and he's the, to have handcuffs. He'd like that. He'd like a perp walk. I do not believe for a second that the DA is going to do that. The DA is being very careful about this, is being very sensitive, I think, about the ways in which he's going to be arraigned. They're going to make special provisions. The police are already called at him. If you go downtown Manhattan, it looks like they're preparing for a war zone. Um, it's very disturbing. I, I, there's no defendant, I think, we know in history, who's ever a potential defendant, who's ever behaved in this fashion, calling out a mob. That said, there were not that many people there. Last Tuesday, when Donald Trump announced that he was going to be indicted, he wanted many people to come and demonstrate. There were not that ma many people. It's unclear how many people will be there this Tuesday, assuming he shows up. But the police will be prepared. The DA's office is prepared. New York City is prepared. We're not going to succumb to mob rule. We've got to uphold the rule of law. Let me ask you about Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, uh, who said, Florida will not assist in an extradition request, given the questionable circumstances at issue with this Soros-backed Manhattan prosecutor and his political agenda. Unpack all of this. It's shocking. Let's just start there. Never before has a governor said, we are not going to abide by the law. Right? Governors are required, if they get an extradition warrant from a governor in another state, to make sure that person gets sent to the state. So DeSantis first has said, I am not going to uphold the law here. The other part, the horrible part that, that continues to feed racist and anti-Semitic violence in ma many places is, is talking about Bragg or other prosecutors as Soros prosecutors. That is just a dog whistle for anti-Semitism, and it is just feeding the ways in which the, this country is terribly divided. I wanted to read for you the beginning of a piece by Chris Hedges in Sheer Post called The Donald Trump Problem, and get your response, Professor Yaroshevsky. Donald Trump, facing four government-run investigations, three criminal and one civil targeting himself and his business, is not being targeted because of his crimes. 
Nearly every serious crime he's accused of carrying out has been committed by his political rivals. He's being targeted because he's deemed dangerous for his willingness, at least rhetorically, to reject the Washington consensus regarding neoliberal free market and free trade policies, as well as the idea that the U.S. should oversee a global empire. He has not only belittled the ruling ideology, but urged his supporters to attack the apparatus that maintains the duopoly by declaring the 2020 election illegitimate. The Donald Trump problem, Chris Hitchens writes, is the same as the Richard Nixon problem. When Nixon was forced to resign under the threat of impeachment, it wasn't for his involvement in war crimes and crimes against humanity, nor was it for his illegal use of the CIA and other federal agencies to spy upon, intimidate, harass and destroy radicals, dissidents and activists. Nixon was brought down because he targeted other members of the ruling political and economic establishment. Once Nixon, like Trump, attacked the centers of power, the media was unleashed to expose abuses and illegalities that had previously minimized or ignored, Chris Hedges writes. Your response? There's always political commentary of any time there is an indictment that, that ends up in the media. So on the right wing, the right wing now, like Trump and others, are saying, this is just a politics in action. This is just a political indictment. You're just trying to interfere with Trump's election possibility. So that's on the right. Chris Hedges on the left, you know, is, is indicating though this is done this is done for other political reasons. So let me just say this. There are always political consequences to an indictment from which people in the media and the blogosphere can talk about the way in which they see it. But the point here is we have a system, and we try to have a system of the rule of law, where if people are violating the law, they're violating the law, the prosecutors investigate the facts, they have discretion as to what to do, but we expect, and we, we expect that there will be accountability in law. There may be other consequences from which people can argue politically. For instance, Donald Trump may say, if he is convicted, if he is indicted, it will affect his election. No doubt that is true, or it should be true. It may be true. People may vote for him anyway. But there will be consequences. And similarly, as Chris Hedges argues, you can argue all day long the reasons, the reasons underlying the indictment. But we're looking at cases that, that really are about the legal system and whether we believe in a legal system and the rule of law. Can you compare what's happening now, this unprecedented indictment against a former president of the United States, with what happened to John Edwards, I remember, when he was running for president? After nine days of he was indicted, after nine days of deliberation, the jury deadlocked on five of the six felony counts against the former senator. Um, the government had accused him of orchestrating nearly a million dollar in payments two wealthy Edwards donors made to hide his pregnant uh, mistress from the media during a critical phase of his 2008 bid for the White House. So, yes, in fact, um, there, there were acquittals there. And it's the same question here, which is, were the, can they prove that those payments were made with an intent to influence the election? Apparently there, the jury decided no. But John Edwards, the, the case is a, is a bit like apples and oranges, comparing John Edwards and what he's done with Donald Trump. Donald Trump has a much longer history. There are many more indications here of what Do Donald Trump did in terms of influencing the election. And ultimately, it's going to be up to a jury to decide whether or not these payments, these falsified business records, were done with the intent to influence the election. The question is, will the jury decide the way the Edwards jury decides? We don't know. We don't know that. Certainly, um, the Don Donald Trump defense will use that in the media and elsewhere to talk about the case against Trump and why it shouldn't why it shouldn't result in a conviction. Finally, is there a statute of limitations here? Well, the, the, it, that's an interesting question, Amy. The, the, the idea is the statute of limitation was told. That means it was stopped, and additional time is added. Told means because, for instance, because of Cuomo. Um, and, and Andrew Cuomo said we're tolling a variety of things because of COVID. So that's one. And there's also a question as to tolling generically under the criminal pr procedure law. I assume the defense is going to raise that issue. It appears now as if that, yes, in fact, the case can go forward because the statute was tolled from 2016 onward.
Well, Aaron, Ellen Yaroshevsky, we thank you so much for being with us, professor of law at Hofstra University you. Law School, as we will continue, of course, to cover this historic indictment uh, throughout next week. Coming up, over a thousand protesters flooded Tennessee's state capitol building Thursday, demanding an end to gun violence following Monday's mass school shooting that killed three nine-year-olds and three adults. We'll speak with an emergency room doctor who took part in the protests. Stay with us. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As we turn to Nashville, Tennessee, where funeral services begin today for the three nine-year old children killed in a mass shooting at the Covenant School Monday, along with three adults. This comes as a dramatic scene unfolded Thursday, as more than a thousand students flooded the Tennessee State Capitol in downtown Nashville to call for gun control. I heard that the shooter at the school uh, last uh, this Monday um, obtained all of their weapons legally. Um, and now they're trying to pass concealed carry so that teenagers can carry guns. And I do not think that it makes the problem better arming more people. Joining the students were teachers, parents and grandparents. This is Debbie Wilbur. It was important for me to be here today because I have children, I have grandchildren, and I am looking for looking out for my future grandchildren. And we just don't have a government here in Tennessee that's willing to do anything about gun laws. And no one, in my opinion, needs an AR-15. I think all weapons like that, assault weapons, should be banned. The only person that should be carrying assault weapons is the military. Protesters also lined the halls inside the state capitol as Tennessee Highway Patrol members escorted lawmakers to the House chamber. As chants rang out in the halls, two freshman state Democratic lawmakers used a bullhorn on the chamber floor to interrupt the session underway and call on their colleagues to address gun safety. Republicans hold a supermajority in Tennessee's legislature of loosened gun restrictions. Republican Governor Bill Lee signed a permitless carry bill into law at Beretta Gun Factory and state lawmakers failed to pass a red flag law that may have prevented the shooter from legally acquiring three of the guns used in Monday's attack because they'd reportedly been under doctor's care for an emotional disorder. Tennessee Republicans are now considering measures to further deregulate gun laws. One bill would let people as young as 18 carry rifles and shotguns in public without a permit. Another would allow education workers to carry concealed handguns on school grounds with a permit. A recently resurfaced 2021 Christmas card from Republican Tennessee Congress member Andy Ogles, who represents the district where Covenant School is located in Nashville, shows him posing with his wife and children, all holding their long guns, their Christmas card. This was Ogles' fellow Tennessee Republican Congress member Tim Burchett's response to Monday's shooting. It's a horrible, horrible situation, and we're not going to fix it. Criminals are going to be criminals. And my daddy fought in the Second World War, fought in the Pacific, fought the Japanese, and he told me, he said, buddy, he said, if somebody wants to take you out and doesn't mind losing their life, there's not a whole heck of a lot you can do about it. For more on what could be done, we're joined by Dr. Katrina Green, emergency physician in Nashville, who's lost patience to gun violence. She joined in the protest at the Tennessee Capitol to call for gun reform yesterday. Thank you for joining us after working a night shift. Talk about the protest and what you're demanding, and also talk about what assault weapons mean when someone is shot by one. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so yesterday was was a tough day for a lot of us. Uh, this has been a tough week in Nashville, but it was really encouraging to see how many people showed up at the state capitol yesterday, especially the young people. Um, and the mood in the crowd was was mixed. Uh, there was a lot of grief. I saw many folks in tears, but mostly 
uh, people are angry. And, and that's part of the reason why I went down there as well, because I'm angry. I'm an emergency physician. I have worked at trauma centers here in Nashville and have trained in trauma centers in both Detroit and Indianapolis. And I've treated at this point in my 10 year career, you know, countless gun violence victims. And um, it's, it's very tough to treat those injuries in the emergency department because it's not just the injury from the direct penetration of the bullet, it's also the reverberation and the ricochet that, that happens as the bullet passes through the body. So the bullet shot from a high capacity weapon like an AR-15 doesn't just go through and through, it shatters everything that it passes by as it enters and exits the body. So we see just devastating injuries and, and it, most oftentimes these people are, are dead by the time they reach us and we do our best, but we lose way too many patients to gun violence. Can you talk about the Republican governor, Bill Lee, um, deregulate, signing off on deregulating guns in a Beretta gun factory? <laughs> Yeah, the, the optics of that were, were just infuriating. Um, Tennessee has become a state where it just seems like they want everybody to have a gun, no matter what. Um, and so signing that bill in a gun factory it basically signals that, that they are siding with the gun lobby and the gun manufacturers, and they really don't care how many people in Tennessee get hurt and die as a result of this guns for all policy that they're uh, they're advocating for. The first funeral is being held today for a little girl, a nine-year-old who loved pink, and they're asking everyone to wear pink to the funeral. She loved bright colors. Evelyn Dickhouse, um, can you talk about the response of Nashville, uh, of the whole community, and how prevalent is your demand for gun control? So the response from the community has been an outpouring of, of love and togetherness and the sense of community. You know, that's kind of the Nashville way. We've been through a lot in the last few years. We've had a tornado and you know, we've gone through the same pandemic everyone else has gone through. We had a bombing downtown on Christmas Day. Uh, I believe that was in 2020 as well. And uh, our community is very good at coming together and supporting those in need in times of need. And that's what's happened this week. We've seen vigils. We've seen outpourings of donations to uh, that school and GoFundMes of the families to help them bury these children. Uh, I myself have a nephew that's nine years old, the same age as these children. And I just cannot imagine what these families are going through. And so I I wholeheartedly support them and and just want them to know that they are loved and we are all devastated by the loss that they are feeling. I mean, talking about this hitting close to home, the governor who signed the deregulation of guns in a gun factory, um, on Monday night, his wife, uh, Tennessee's first lady, Maria Lee, was set to have dinner with one of her best friends, Cindy Peake, an old colleague from her teacher days who planned to spend the day as a substitute teacher at the Covenant School. But Peake never arrived home on Monday. Uh, the 61-year-old woman was one of six victims slain in the deadliest school shooting in Tennessee history. What happened at Covenant School was a tragedy beyond comprehension, Governor Lee said in a recorded address uh, Tuesday night, his first extended comments on the shooting. I was reading from the Tennessean newspaper, Dr. Green. Yeah, so, you know, I watched that video as well, and I felt very disappointed in, in that being his response to the shooting. He did not as far as I know, go down and visit the school to comfort those families. Uh, but I know there were state lawmakers who were there in the church across the street. There was the reunification center holding hands of families that were waiting for word about whether their loved ones were, were alive or coming home. And uh, you know, for Governor Lee's wife to be so closely tied to the school and for him to not even show up I mean, there's a reason why the crowd was chanting cowards yesterday, because that's what we all feel collectively as a city, that 
we're the capital city. You know, he's here doing, conducting his business. He lives in Franklin, which is a suburb just south of here. Why doesn't he show up? Why isn't he in our community? I do not see a lot of leadership coming from our governor. What I see is a failure of leadership. You've written a lot of commentary, Dr. Katrina Green, about the fight for reproductive rights in Tennessee, uh, where there was an attempt to criminalize doctors who performed abortions to save the life of a pregnant person. What are your thoughts, seeing so much being done to curb reproductive rights, but nothing being done for gun safety? I think it just shows you where the priorities of our state leaders are. They they care more about protecting uh, potential life in a womb than they do about protecting children who are alive and living and breathing and attending schools. I, I do not see any concern or care for for protecting precious life that is already you know, present in our community. And and that is, I think, the definition of hypocrisy. I am angry at the fact that reproductive rights have been taken away, uh, but I, I'm more angry at the fact that they won't protect life when it's already born. Um, I, I just, I don't know what else we can do to get through to these people. Um, Pro-life is not pro-AR-15. Pro-life is not, you know, lacks gun laws. If you want to protect children, keep guns out of the hands of folks who would do them harm. Do everything possible to, to protect them by, by making it harder for folks to commit these atrocities. You know, we don't even have a red flag law in Tennessee, which would have prevented this, you know, the person who committed these acts from purchasing at least some of these weapons. Um, and, and might have been able to get that person better help for the mental distress that, you know, you assume would cause someone to commit a horrible act like that. Um, I, the most common sense thing to me would be to, to institute a red flag law so that we can disarm folks who are going through a, a mental crisis. And not just folks who are, are having you know, homicidal thoughts, but suicidal thoughts. We lose so many Tennesseans to gun suicides every year as well. And I've been present in those emergency rooms as well. And and it is very hard to treat those. And, and those families are in a rough way as well. Well, Dr. Katrina Green, we thank you so much for being with us. Our condolences for your whole community. Dr. Green is an emergency physician in Nashville, Tennessee, who joined in the protest at the Tennessee Capitol Thursday with another thousand people calling for gun control. Well, we're going to go from Tennessee uh, to Florida, which brings up this meme that has been going around. It's a picture of a pile of books, and it says, "'Never in recorded history has a four-year-old found his father's loaded book and accidentally killed his younger sister, but we ban books.'" So, from Tennessee to Florida to Capitol Hill. On Wednesday, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy said Republicans want to see all the facts before proposing any new gun legislation in the wake of the latest school shooting. That prompted a heated confrontation between New York Congressmember Jamal Bowman and Kentucky Republican Congressmember Thomas Massey, just off the House floor, where Bowman accused Republicans of refusing to save children's lives. Did cowards, a nine-year-old, three nine-year-olds, are they going to those funerals? No, they never go to the funerals. They never go to the scene of the mass shootings. And it's not just in schools. It's in black and brown communities every day. Republican Thomas Massey responded to Bowman by saying, quote, there's never been a school shooting in a school that allows teachers to carry, unquote. In 2021, Kentucky Congressman Massey tweeted a photo of himself and six family members as kids holding assault-style rifles with the caption, Merry Christmas, P.S. Santa, please bring ammo. 
This comes after Manuel Oliver, father of Joaquim, one of 17 people killed in the 2018 mass shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, was arrested at a hearing last week in the Republican-controlled House of Representatives after he and his wife, Patricia, spoke out during a subcommittee hearing on the Second Amendment that was chaired by Texas Republican Pat Fallon. Florida Democrat and committee member Maxwell Frost tweeted a video of Oliver, quote, being arrested for speaking out at a committee hearing. Manny is a hero. He didn't deserve this. So the video shows Capitol Police pushing Patricia Oliver away as they pin her husband Manny to the ground outside the hearing room. Well, Manny Oliver joins us now from his home in Parkland, Florida. He co-founded the gun reform group Change the Ref and engaged in countless protests for action on gun control. He's an artist, and much of what he does is murals and art and resistance. His new op-ed for The Daily Beast is headlined, Arrest Gun-Loving Members of Congress, Not Grieving Fathers. Manny Oliver, welcome back to Democracy Now! It's been five years since you lost Guac, and so many lost their loved ones in Parkland. And now, week after week, I think in 2023, there is a mass shooting at a school alone every single week in this country. What are you calling for? Well, I'm calling for a, a, a different reaction from from us, from you. From, from our neighbors. Uh, this is a, a, a situation that at some point is going to hit either directly or indirectly. Every time we see someone um, being shot, there is an immediate circle of people that is also being hurt, uh, mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters. So I think it's time to um, really have something so we can uh, stop the absurd debate with uh, representatives that we already know are not willing to do anything, um, and then have like a nationwide strike, educational strike, from all levels of education. Uh, this is, for the teachers, their place of work, and they don't feel safe. The kids have drills. Our kids train how to survive these shootings, and it's even worse than that. You have to I want people to understand that what happened on on that school in Nashville, probably the kids thought it was a drill. So put that in your heads and, and, and now let me know if it deserves us to do something more extreme or not. The kids thought it was a drill. That's what you're saying, Manny? That is exactly what I'm saying, because it, it this terrorizing um, um, possibility, uh, predictable, it's not even a possibility, it's, there's a big chance that it could happen. Um, it's, not a, it's not like a lottery. It's really easy to happen, because we have so weak gun loss, and, and the kids are being traumatized on a weekly basis. Every day they need to go out for a drill. Our kids have been training how to survive these shootings. And guess what? We are about to hear from someone that we need to train them better. In other words, it's their own fault. They did not train enough. We need to arm teachers. So, because everything is absurd, we need something to negotiate. We need power, and we need people to stand up. 
Manny, this is not about lighting up a candle. You're calling for an education strike across the country. Explain what you want to see happen. Well, I am sick of going to the Capitol Hill buildings, knocking doors, and explaining with my pain, with our suffering, that this is not good. They already told us that they won't do anything. And we have seen it happening for decades. So I think that big changes, when society needs them and it's requiring for them, and this is what we're seeing this week, uh, need extreme solutions. So that's why I'm asking for the power of the educators to get on board. We can stop this from happening. We can really demand things. There's nothing that I can demand now. I don't have the power to demand to politicians, which negligence is not going to move anywhere. So we need to get together seriously. Otherwise, this will vanish, like, like Parkland vanished, like uh, Santa Clarita vanished, like Uvalde vanished. And we cannot allow that to happen. I'm sick of this. And I will do everything that it takes everything that it takes. I'm flying to Tennessee tomorrow, by the way, and we have an event on Monday at 1030. And finally, Manny Oliver, your response to the congressman where you were arrested last week and the police officers, we see Patricia, your wife, um, uh, demanding change in the hearing room and then you being uh, tackled outside and them pushing her away. We have 20 seconds. Well, that's, that's the norm. Um, at this point, it's irrelevant. Getting arrested is something that I'm, I, it happened to me a couple of times. But, but I don't regret that, because I made my point. Now, I can point at that chairman and say, tell him that you have done nothing. My wife, Patricia, works every day on protecting your kids. So you should be following everything that we do. We're on the right side, Amy. We're on the right side of this battle. Well, Manuel Oliver, we thank you so much for being with us. And again, our condolences. Uh, Manny is co-founder of the gun reform group Change the Ref, father of Joaquim, one of 17 people killed five years ago in the mass shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. We'll link to your piece in uh, The Daily Beast. Happy birthday to Mike Burke. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining us.